Now today I know I wrote a sermon that Cooper read last week that kind of jumps us out of the John 6 text, but two weeks ago I preached about how there was a crowd of people that were trying to find Jesus after he pulled off the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, and they were so impressed with Jesus that they wanted to make him king. Little did they know that Jesus could walk on water and he snuck away without their knowing, but they did eventually catch up to him and he informed us that there are ways in which we can seek after Jesus that are not good, that we seek after Him in attempts and to cover our own ends, and we just view Him as a means to those ends. Well, Jesus set the record straight and said that the feeding of the 5,000 and all His other miracles are just signs that point to the real thing He is here to do. And today we jump back into this I am the bread of life discourse. So we have this same crowd who sought Jesus that with wanting their stomachs to be filled, and He is continuing to teach them why He has really come. The real act of provision that that miracle they experienced was really meant to point them towards, that it was meant to point us towards. But as we get to His words today, there's one catch. They're hard words to hear. They're words that sound outrageous and unbelievable, and yet we're asked to believe them. And the text even tells us towards the end of our gospel reading today that after Jesus says what He says today, many of the people who were following up to that point, they turn away and no longer follow Him. And the truth is, that result continues to this very day. So what is it about what Jesus is going to say that makes it so difficult to believe? Well, He doesn't waste any time in our gospel reading today. It's the very first verse that tells us what this is going to be about. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, this is a very offensive thing to say. Not only the fact that he's saying that this bread that he's giving is his flesh, which they'll start arguing about that in a moment, but they were already arguing up to that point that Jesus had claimed to be the bread that came down from heaven. And one of the reasons for that is they were like, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? We know he came from Nazareth. How is it that he says that he has come down from heaven, which, if we can put ourselves in that headspace, makes sense. Imagine a kid who grew up in the town next to you whose parents you know saying, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. I think your response would be quite similar. But now he's going to get even more offensive, talking about the bread of life being his flesh. And it causes them to argue, who are already arguing, they say, how is it that this man could give them his flesh to eat? You know, sometimes critics of this text will say, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. Well, that's clearly how it was understood by the reaction of the people, and Jesus does not bother to explain it away. And we can resonate with their reaction because when it's the first time that you hear these words, either because you're an adult convert to the faith or in confirmation when it's first really taught to you in depth, our reaction is similar. We really, we're really eating the body and blood of Jesus. What a scandalous thing to say. But surely Jesus is going to clarify that that's not really what He's talking about, right? He can't really be advocating for some form of cannibalism, can He? Well, maybe He misspoke. Yeah, that's what it is. He misspoke. Let's see what he does to clear the air. Hearing their arguments, Jesus responds, and he does clarify, but maybe not in the way our rational, reasonable minds would have hoped. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Eesh. That wasn't what I was looking for, Jesus. In fact, he adds another element that is also hard to stomach. 
pun intended, that not only are we eating His flesh, but we're drinking His blood. Now, to the Jewish listener at this time, this would have been highly offensive because in the old covenant of God, He forbids them from drinking blood. The consequences are dire because it is, he says in Leviticus 17, that it is where the life is contained, is in the blood. But as it is with all the hard sayings of Jesus, once He's made it clear that it isn't an easily explainable interpretation, not the one that we had hoped for, we must reckon with what Jesus is teaching and saying here. After all, we know that from the other places in the Gospels, when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, it's as if He's saying, if you thought you didn't hear me correctly, then take note of what I'm about to say. It's a way of His saying, pay attention. This next part is important. And Jesus is clearly talking about His own flesh and blood as the food of faith in God. Now, today in the church, this teaching still gives pause to those who seek to follow Jesus, even those like the crowd who have followed Him some way, who have liked some of the things that He said and some of the things He's advocated for. And we see many people who are not believers in Jesus who would even say that they like some of the things He says and the things He stands for. But not many who are believers give much credence to what Jesus says here. In fact, to them it sounds crazy and scandalous and offensive. And if you've ever tried to explain to somebody who doesn't have faith what exactly is going on in the Lord's Supper, it's a difficult conversation to have because how can they make sense of it when even we can't apart from faith? But we'll come back to that discussion in a moment. I think before that discussion, there's one more teaching present here in this text that we must examine. Before this text is about the sacrament, because the sacrament has not been instituted yet at the time that Jesus is talking here, it is about the sacrifice of the cross. Remember, the temporary provision of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is saying is a sign. It's meant to point us toward the real act, the ultimate act of provision that God has sent Jesus here to do, which is the sacrifice of His body and blood on the cross. A cross, the cross is the sacrifice of the perfect, unblemished flesh and blood of the Son of God. A sacrifice made to atone for the corrupted and sinful flesh of sinners, sinners like you and like me. Here, when Jesus calls Himself the bread that comes down from heaven, He's referring to this provision of His flesh and blood, the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Yet the way that sacrifice, that provision, becomes a sacrifice specifically for you is not yet complete. How does Jesus' sacrifice on the cross become one that is made for you? We can go back to the Old Testament, we can see some of the foreshadowing of what Jesus is talking about here. When the Israelites sacrificed the unblemished firstborn male lamb in Exodus to be spared from God's righteous judgment of death on sin, the angel of death that's sent to Egypt passes over their house because they had eaten the flesh of the lamb and they had put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, flesh and blood. When God made His dwelling among His people in the tabernacle and eventually the temple in Jerusalem, the flesh of the sacrifices was burned, parts were consumed by the priests, and the blood was cast on the people by Moses. It was also cast upon the altar, on the instruments used in the sacrifice, as well as the floor in the front of the altar. It turns out that redemption from sin and God's forgiveness is a bloody business. Why does it require such sacrifice? Well, the Old Testament teaches in Leviticus 17 that in the blood is where the life is. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. First and foremost, what Jesus is referring to as being the bread that has come down from heaven in our text today 
is that His body and blood will serve as the sacrifice which will provide atonement for the world, washed clean in the flood of His blood. Yet in the Old Testament, there is also always some ritual that involved the people that brought the application of God's atonement to them. Right? You have the great big objective atonement of God, and then it gets applied to His people. In the past, it was the consumption of the lamb by the people fleeing Egypt, the offering of your own animal to be the atonement for your sins in the the ritual worship of the tabernacle and the temple. And yet, this sacrifice, this provision, couldn't complete the atonement. It was only a temporary provision, much like what Jesus is teaching the people who've sought Him out over the feeding of the 5,000. It's a temporary sign that points to an eternal one. Something greater is needed than the filling of your belly or spilling the blood of animals. And that something greater is what Jesus teaches today. He teaches that all those other sacrifices point to the one ultimate sacrifice in Him, the sacrifice of His flesh and blood for the atonement of the whole world, an eternal life given, an eternal life received. His flesh and blood that will provide for your atonement and mine and bring to you by virtue of His blood a new and eternal life. Now, Jesus emphasizes this connection of consumption further in verses 54 to 57. It is the feeding that binds us to the life of Christ, which is imperishable. His life, which overcomes death and the resurrection, is now in those who feed on His flesh and His blood. He emphasizes one more and new thing in this provision. The bread that God's people had been given up to this point was temporary, not any longer. In verse 58, Jesus emphasizes that He, the new bread that has come down from heaven, isn't a temporary provision, but an eternal one. He says in verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This indeed is a hard saying. Not only are we saying that we are eating and drinking the body and blood of Jesus, for indeed that is our confession, by the mystery of faith, but that by this eating we have obtained the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, the very life of Jesus. That is why Paul speaks of the eating and drinking in the Lord's Supper as a participation in the sacrifice of the cross. Neither of these claims makes sense to our reason. Right? They don't even ask a question about one, which is how can a person be the bread of life, much less that person's flesh be the food of faith, the food by which life is given. Yet because of what Jesus says here and when He institutes the Lord's Supper later on, we believe what He says about this is my body, this is my blood. The eternal gracious provision of God that creates and sustains in you the new eternal life given to you through the atonement of Jesus. Thus, at this altar, we understand that Jesus is speaking of a twofold eating. This is what we confess in our confessional documents in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. At first, there's the eating, the non-literal eating of faith. This refers to the faith given in the promises of what is received in this sacrament. It is faith that takes hold of and receives that promise of the cross and the resurrection, that God's Son is indeed the bread that has come down from heaven, the ultimate provision for the atonement of the world. Second, it is the bodily eating and drinking of what will become known as the sacrament, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, that makes this for you. This ritual Christ institutes for the church to bodily eat and to drink the fruits of the cross, His body and blood, so that His great atonement for all of the world and this new life that He has come to give are given to you, for you. Luther points out how both of these things in his small catechism explanation and answer 
to the question of how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things emphasize these two fold, this twofold eating. That given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins and the bodily eating and drinking are the main thing in the sacrament. The non-literal eating of faith in the promises and the literal eating of the flesh and blood in the bread and wine of the Son of God Himself. They are indeed the bread that has come down from heaven, and they are indeed given and shed for you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is indeed the bread that has come down from heaven. And it's true, it is a hard saying, one that we know can only be grasped by faith. It offends our reason and confuses our senses. Yet it is indeed true. This is His body. This is His blood. And so we're left in the position of the twelve, echoed in the words of Peter today at the end of our reading, starting in verse 67. After everybody who has heard this and was offended and could not believe it turned away, He turns to His twelve disciples and says, are you also going to leave? And Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Dear brothers and sisters, so it is for us that we grasp this mystery in faith, that we believe that Jesus has provided for our atonement and new life through the giving of His body and blood on the cross, and that it is given and shed for you in this sacrament. Come, receive this heavenly food and believe that it is indeed given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of Jesus, amen.